Hello, uh, I'm Amelia and I work for Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Uh, I'm the conservation officer um, and this basically means that I look after the local wildlife site system. Um, so first off, what is a local wildlife site? Well, local wildlife sites have a local emphasis. They support habitats or species that have a regional importance. They've been recognised of having substantial nature conservation value due to their distinctiveness. And distinctiveness is basically whether it refers to a habitat being of high, medium or low value um, to wildlife. Um, or local wildlife sites are sometimes recognised um, due to the presence of threatened or rare species uh, or habitats. Um, and some of the times these are considered priority species or habitats, such as those that are BAPS, Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, so as lo lo local wildlife sites are recognised locally, they are found across our country in every single county. There are almost 44,000 of these sites forming a network over the entire country. Uh, and in Cheshire, we have over 1,000 of these sites. Uh, as these sites are identified locally, they're sometimes given different names. Uh, you might hear them referred to as SNCIs, Sites of Nature Conservation Important, or SINCs, Sites of Importance for Nature Conservation. Uh, but this reference is almost historical um, because there's been a national standardization process um, that provides a little bit more integrity to the local wildlife site system. Um, so this national standardization approach has led to um, it being formed of partners um, that will identify, select and monitor local wildlife sites. It is usually administered on a county wide approach. So in Cheshire, uh, this encompasses Cheshire West and Chester, Cheshire East, Holton, Warrington and Wirral. Uh, Manchester and Merseyside have different systems. Um, they are under a separate biological record centre and the criteria is um, set differently that reflects this more urban environment. So sites are only selected if they meet this local criteria. Um, and it's mostly set out by knowledgeable individuals or groups um, that might have that county uh, knowledge. Um, so in Cheshire, um, this criteria was last updated in 2013 and we're currently wanting to review this um, and just see how it, it's still, yeah, just uh, constantly updating it. Um, so once the sites uh, have been surveyed, um, they then need to be approved. So once it meets criteria, it still needs to be approved. Um, and this is done by a local partnership. Um, they're normally thought, formed of local authorities, local wildlife groups, uh, Natural England and the County Biological Record Centre. So that's a record in Cheshire um, who's hosting tonight's event. So local wildlife sites are non-statutory, which means they have no legal protection in comparison to some of our statutory sites, such as triple SI sites of special scientific interest. Uh, although there is minimal protection for these sites, they are given consideration and recognition within the planning system and the national planning policy, which is really important that they are recognised as being of local value. So local wildlife sites can really look different from one to another. Uh, they can vary in shape and size, uh, with some sites being less than one hectare in size, such as narrow road verges, or a much larger encompassing entire woodlands. Uh, the shape also may be affected due to the reasons it's been designated. Uh, for instance, um, a presence of water vol might mean that uh, the entire uh, watercourse would be then designated uh, because of these breeding territories. Um, but they're always um, given that protection uh, locally. Um, 
so that would reflect the landscape and um, they're usually semi-natural habitats um, grasslands wetlands um, woodlands um, but yeah the focus or is is that localness uh, and that's what Cheshire looks like um, so when you start thinking about um, Cheshire um, it's a very heavy agricultural um, with and it has changed drastically um, in the last 60 years, the discovery of an application of fertilizer um, has shaped how farming is done and yeah, it's just changed it. Um, many habitats, uh, including grasslands, are particularly sensitive to the nitrogen input um, with many botanical species um, being outcompeted with uh, this higher nutrients um, in the soil. Um, it's been estimated that 99% of uh, species rich grasslands in Cheshire have been destroyed, which is a huge number. Um, really important then that these sites are looked after, these grassland sites are looked after. This nitrogen nutrient input um, and change in management favouring silage over traditional haymaking has meant that the remaining species rich grasslands, which this one is, um, are of significant value within the region. Uh, these grasslands are fantastic for many species, including pollinators, um, but also have a really important bio botanical interest. Um, so, um, Basically, a species rich grassland means there are lots of different herbs within the sward. So you can see here that there's meadow vetchling and uh, birds that trefoil as well. Um, so the other thing is that these different species can help identify what type of grassland it is so that might be due to the soil and they are indicator species and we use these indicator species as part of the local wildlife site criteria uh, for instance uh, knapweed is a neutral grassland indicator berry flax is a calcareous um, grassland indicator uh, tormentil normally an acidic grasslands and marsh sank foil in marshy grasslands so it's really important that we can use these to identify whether a site passes or doesn't meet criteria um, but something that we do in Cheshire is we actually recognize uh, restorable grasslands um, and that's um, because we've lost so many and we basically want to identify sites that can be put back um, in favourable conditions for wildlife. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have in Cheshire, um, Cheshire Wildlife Trust does a number of projects um, that basically is wanting to restore these grasslands um, to a better quality. Uh, so wetlands are another habitat that you might, um, that are within our landscape. Uh, they are really diverse, um, marshes, bogs, reed beds, um, but also ditches and ponds. Uh, ponds are a really familiar feature throughout our landscape and support two thirds of our freshwater invertebrates. Uh, apparently Cheshire has more ponds than any other county. Um, so what makes a good pond in Cheshire is different to another local region. So for instance, in Cheshire, uh, we require 10 aquatic vegetation species uh, for ponds to be selected. Um, but in West Yorkshire, this can be as little as five species. Of course, these lists might differ um, and they might have, a, you know, due to the local biodiversity, ecology and geology of the area, but it just shows that there is a difference um, between different places. Um, so despite the high abundance of ponds in Cheshire, many have been lost and in recent years as many as 80% are considered uh, to be in poor, very poor condition. Uh, Oh yeah, I've got a picture of a grass snake here, sorry. Um, and that's because um, 
many species um, depend on ponds, but many will actually benefit from um, the wetland um, landscape, and that includes um, species like the grass snake. Um, so wetlands benefit all these different species, um, and local wildlife sites aren't necessarily just selected purely on habitat. Um, for instance, a fantastic pond might qualify in its own right, um, but it might also um, qualify because of dragonfly assemblages, uh, amphibian populations, uh, and in Cheshire, we have all rare species. So for instance, one of our local wildlife sites is identified uh, because of the lesser silver water beetle. Um, and it basically, this is a rare species and it's protected um, under this local wildlife system. Uh, so Woodlands are a re another really valuable habitat, um, but Cheshire is the least wooded county. Only about 5% of Cheshire has been identified as natural broadleaf woodland. Woodlands are therefore important, especially those that have high native tree composition uh, and are selected under the local wildlife site criteria. Um, that's because Many invertebrates are generalists, um, but some are species specific. So our native trees support a wider range of species. Um, for instance, oaks support over 500 species of invertebrates and lichens. Uh, woodlands are valuable habitats. Um, but that's also because of their um, ground flora, um, because they are uh, early plants uh, and they provide this early nectar source. Um, so some woodlands um, might even be identified under a species criteria um, as bluebells are a schedule eight species um, and under the Wildlife and Countryside Act and therefore they are important, we want to protect them. Um, and it's important that these woodlands are identified and recognised as it's very easy for woodlands to become isolated, impacting the species, the, the species because they require physical linkages for dispersal. Uh, for instance, willow tits are known to have very poor dispersal and are limited by their breeding habitat. They're associated with wet woodland requiring decaying wood to excavate their nest holes. Um, but in Cheshire, we can protect these uh, nesting sites under the local wildlife site system, which is brilliant. So uh, irreplaceable habitats, you know, they aren't just habitats that Cheshire recognise, they're usually recognised by other counties as well, um, but veteran trees are super important for biodiversity, especially as over 2000 uh, invertebrate species are dependent on dead wood. And so like I've said, um, other counties will put emphasis on this irreplaceable habitat and that's sometimes because they are internationally recognised uh, as being important. England has the highest representation of veteran oak trees in Europe um, and Cheshire doesn't just recognise the veteran oaks, we recognise other veteran trees as well. Um, so many um, veteran trees are normally found within ancient woodland, funnily enough, uh, which is another irreplaceable habitat. Uh, but in Cheshire, there are, is less than 2,000 hectares of ancient woodland left, which is about the size of Macclesfield Parish Council, which is a very small part of Cheshire if you really think about it. Um, but all of these woodlands, ancient woodlands, would be protected under the local wildlife site system, which is what we want. So why are local wildlife sites important? Uh, they form part of our landscape 
um, as we know it. They support wildlife scene that we see visiting our gardens. Um, but it's also important um, as they provide, they are important in their own right. Uh, they are sanctuaries uh, for many species, including those that are threatened. Uh, they are areas of semi-natural habitats uh, that are vital for landscape and they are, can provide or be part of na nature's restoration. Uh, but local wildlife sites aren't just semi-natural habitats, uh, they also can be linear features, so such as hedgerows, uh, verges, uh, rivers, and they're sometimes referred to as nature's highways. Um, so that means that local wildlife sites are identified for their position and role within the landscape. For instance, the cycleway in Chester is a local wildlife site and has botanical interest, but it forms part of a wildlife corridor through the city of Chester, uh, along with Shropshire Union Canal, which is also identified as a local wildlife site, showing just how important these sites are in an urban setting. Uh, other linear features identified for biodiversity are hedgerows. They are not only important ecologically, but historically. Um, some are veterans and have been there for ages uh, and will be his irreplaceable. Uh, these can be recognised nationally as priority habitat. Um, but in Cheshire, we only require that hedgerows needing four under the local wildlife site system. And that's because we realise that there are wider benefits that they provide for farmland birds, invertebrates, and even bats, which can use them to navigate, which is amazing. So rivers in Cheshire are selected by flora, such as waters crow fit or shingles that support aquatic invertebrates. Uh, many rivers um, act as this corridor. Um, and in Cheshire, we always would want a six metre buffer um, to basically uh, give nature space. Um, many rivers are associated with species that move through the landscape, um, such as birds, uh, kingfishers, dippers and wagtails. Uh, these are species that actually carry a higher importance because they could be considered uh, the canary in the coal mine, as it were, um, using these species to identify what might be going on underneath the surface of the water. So dippers, as I've mentioned, are uh, indicative of high water quality uh, within rivers, and that's because they feed on aquatic invertebrates. Many of these are river flies, uh, stone flies, caddis flies, mayflies, are intolerant to pollution and have been used to monitor and identify pollution incidents and recovery from these. So, Although I have heard in the news uh, that apparently all rivers are polluted, so I guess it's even more important that they are protected and given that value when they provide an ecological benefit. Um, another really important thing for rivers is dispersal. Um, there's been research that shows that banded damsel dragonflies occurrence has been correlated with habitat quality. Their dispersal was impacted by habitat quality and it's this dispersal that's so important uh, for nature and it prevents species isolation and loss. So local wildlife sites provide these havens allowing movement of species um, which is great, uh, especially when it can prevent uh, losing genetic diversity, as it were. So the idea for... So basically, um, 
Sir John Lawton um, released the Making Space for Nature report back in 2010. And his idea from that was that England needed more, bigger, better and connected sites where emphasis was given um, to local wildlife sites um, due to the wide and comprehensive cover that they would give, um, but also how they can provide connections uh, in the landscape. So in essence, uh, what local wildlife site can form these, these stepping stones, as it were, um, so that nature can travel, they have these linear corridors and also buffers from what we call our core sites. So core sites or core areas um, might include your statutory sites. So they are of national importance, such as your triple SIs, international important, which are your SACs, special areas of conservation or SPAs, special protection areas, but also those that have been locally identified, such as local nature reserves. So in Cheshire, this ranges from all the way from the D estuary over here, all the way to bits of the uh, um, the Pennine Moor, which is all the way on this near the Peak District. Um, but despite this, a lot of these sites will overlap. Um, but despite this, it, this cover only actually equates to about six percent of the county that's actually given statutory protection. And even when you look at local wildlife sites, although some of these might form um, core areas, a lot will act as connections, allowing for wildlife to move through the landscape, which I've already said is really important for that species dispersal. Um, so Cheshire is pretty typical compared to the rest of the country, with again approximately about that 6% of the county identified as local wildlife sites. Um, but according to the Lawton report that came out, the local wildlife sites as they stood only formed part of the solution, as in their current form they were too small, undermanaged, and didn't provide enough resilience in our landscape for nature. So the recommendation was that ecological networks would be, you know, should be introduced and they would be achieve, achieve and achieved by enhancing, improving and in restoring. So fast forward 10 years to 2020 and there is finally a proposal for a nature recovery network. It is not a new concept but it's an ideal that is one of the key focuses for the Environment Bill. The idea is that it should be considered alongside farming practices in the farming landscape and the planning reforms to enable nature to, to move through the landscape um, and has a more of a joined up approach. Um, the aim is to increase the extent and quality of natural habitats uh, because the nature recovery networks that protected sites alone don't actually or cannot meet wildlife needs independently and it's the connected landscape that we need for nature's recovery. Um, I'm sure some of you might have been familiar with the State of Nature report that came out in 2019 and it basically found that as many as 40% of species had decreased in abundance with many species being impacted by agriculture urbanisation, pollution and climate change. The purpose of this network is not only to have areas where nature can supposedly thrive, um, such as the core areas, but goes beyond this, allowing for restoration of natural areas, placing value on those that are currently not recognised um, to create a more resilient network. So when I'm saying not recognised, it's basically um, because we have something called potential local wildlife sites in Cheshire um, and to a degree um, the local wildlife site system is only as good as the data we have and these potential local wildlife sites 
are identified by individuals or data that suggest they might qualify, um, but have had no formal survey. Um, just be aware that the pictures or rather the sizes of these aren't actually realistic. Uh, I've enlarged them just so you can sort of see where they are. Um, and that's because many of them are actually just one less than one hectare in size. Um, with over, you know, a, a lot of them can be quite small, but that doesn't mean they're not important. Um, why, you may ask. Um, and that's because when housing developments or big infrastructure projects occur, such as HS2, our local wildlife sites are going to be impacted and the data can help shape these decisions. So it's really important that any, any area that meets local wildlife site criteria is considered a local wildlife site. Uh, so HS2 has made a commitment for no net loss, but not knowing how much is going to be lost is important. So Cheshire Wildlife Trust have been really heavily involved to ensure that the correct mitigation is calculated. Uh, since 2017, we've been involved with resurveying many existing local wildlife sites. Uh, so we've resurveyed 94 existing local wildlife sites. Uh, we've designated 17 new local wildlife sites with the hope that uh, 15 sites will be designated by the end of the year. And many of these sites fall on the HS2 route and the potential local wildlife sites that weren't previously designated can now play a role in ensuring the right level of mitigation and compensation for wildlife is provided for. So again, new changes. The government's released this white paper um, on its new planning reforms. Um, many planning decisions are data led. Therefore, we need robust and trustworthy data uh, that's that we need for the local wildlife site system. As the reform stands, it's based on making decisions on data that isn't quite complete. A lot of the local wildlife site, site information is outdated, and this isn't just a Cheshire problem. Uh, it's suggested that local wildlife sites should be surveyed every 10 years, but available resources have meant that some of these sites have meant haven't been surveyed since the 1990s, which is a really long time ago. Uh, Cheshire Wildlife Trust is committed to ensuring that local wildlife sites uh, data can be a useful tool, both with the creation of the nature recovery network, but also within planning. And for that, we need to continue resurveying existing local wildlife sites, but also identifying new local wildlife sites. And this is where a lot of what I do comes into it, uh, surveying local wildlife sites. Uh, typically, when you go out, uh, you might make draw, draw, have a habitat map, you're out surveying, you might create a species list. Um, and this is also that these can be compared to the criteria. Not only are you generating records for this site, but you can also check to see whether it still meets criteria. Um, and this can help then generate a citation, uh, which details what the site's important for. Um, but it's also important when we go out, we make note of the condition that the site is in. Um, and this is really important so that we can feed back to landowners, uh, whether that's habitat management advice or just generally. Uh, so, Many local wildlife sites are privately owned. Oops, sorry, that's a privately owned, um, but some are owned by the council. Um, but a very small number are actually um, owned by NGOs. So Cheshire Wildlife Trust actually. Uh, owns Carriage Hill, it's a local wildlife site, um, but very few are actually, um, <laughs> let me go the other way around. So lots of them are actually privately owned by farmers. So a lot of the sites might not actually have any public access at all. Um, and because of 
this, um, the management decisions that are made can be hugely influential to the state that the local wildlife site is in. Um, landowners have no statutory obligations to manage local wildlife sites, um, but when we will go out, we'll always try and provide local, that advice to them um, as many small changes can improve the site in some small ways. So as I mentioned, lack of monitoring isn't just a Cheshire problem. In 2018, a report released data um, that suggested in the last five years, only 15% of local wildlife sites have been surveyed with less than 10% receiving management advice. The lack of information about local wildlife sites um, is a huge problem, especially when it comes to uh, development, um, because it suggested that in that five year period, 800 local wildlife sites have been directly or indirectly impacted on. And the condition of these sites, and even more, had been in negative conditions or in a declining condition, which is really worrying when, you know, I'm talking about a nature recovery, how we're going to create this wonderful landscape of connectivity when actually, you know, it looks like it might be going the other way. Um, so the biggest threats to management, uh, uh, sorry, the biggest threats to local wildlife sites is management. Um, whether that is, um, the fact that it is overmanaged um, or undermanaged and, and given no, no attention, um, it can mean that a local wildlife site can deteriorate really quite quickly uh, when this management is inappropriate for the site, um, which means that its ecological value it suddenly can go downhill very quickly. Um, therefore, um, having a positive um, connection with landowners and being able to feed back to them how to manage these sites is really important. Like I remember going to a uh, site um, and the landowner took me out and all around are these lush perennial rye grasslands that are really lush and green and he almost felt a little bit embarrassed that the the local wildlife site wasn't in healthy condition and it was only when I started to point out to him you know the grassland species such as uh, common birds for treffle that he actually realized um, that it was actually a positive thing that this site wasn't lush and green. Um, and it's actually changing these perceptions that can actually make a huge difference. And that's something we're really keen on. Um, so local wildlife sites are effectively um, identified as being the best areas for wildlife within a region besides the statutory site and they should continue to be recognised as valuable and having an important role within the ecological network. Uh, without this continued survey efforts, liaising with landowners and correct habitat management, this system will lose its benefit as more local wildlife sites decline in quality. However, if we continue in, to enhance our landscape, adding to our local wildlife system, then we can aid nature's recovery. And this is a very crude drawing of what it could look like um, if we continue to add to um, the nature recovery network um, and just ensuring that management is in the right places. Um, so we're committed to ensuring that this system works uh, for wildlife, um, providing landowners um, with advice, um, de designating more local wildlife sites, 
and giving these sites the best chance to provide maximum benefits to nature and nature's recovery. Um, <laughs> I've, I've talked a little bit about percentages and the reason for that is that in Cheshire, uh, less than 15% of the county is of, you know, statutory local wildlife sites and potential local wildlife sites and a lot of this isn't in the best condition but the wildlife trusts have made a commitment to get 30 percent of landscape working for nature by 2030 it's a big ask but i know that the local wildlife site system is one of the ways that we can uh, get nature working or getting the landscape to work for nature. Um, so if you would like to get involved at all with surveying local wildlife sites, then we'd really like to hear from you. Um, if you think you know a site that is valuable for wildlife, um, then we really want to hear to, from it to put there. <laughs> we really want to hear about it um, because we can add it to the potential local wildlife sites um, list. We can potentially get it surveyed and then it can become designated and it can just add to that knowledge that we hold on Cheshire. Um, and lastly, it's, you know, it's a very small thing, um, but if you do have any expertise um, on a certain taxonomic group, then as I mentioned, we are looking to revamp our criteria. And so uh, the criteria is here. So if you want to have a look and let us know what you think, then we'd really like to hear from you. So I'm just going to uh, leave you on a quote from Sir David Attenborough. Um, the National Network of Wildlife Sites is important not only to ensure the future of rare species, but also more common ones like thrushes, peacock butterflies and cowslips.